We're live. Welcome, my friends, to Pain and Glory and a new take on both circumcision and cannabis. In today's class, we are going to be examining the final verses of uh, an extraordinary Torah. We will be talking about the Brit Milah, freely translated as circumcision, specifically the process and the pain associated with it, and perhaps compellingly, we are going to talk about cannabis, marijuana, and substances that can make us feel better. Should we? Is it the Torah way? Would God be displeased if we checked out for a little while? I hope that you'll stay with me, and I really think that you'll be inspired as well as uplifted by the things we are going to learn today. Let's begin by quickly reviewing this amazing Torah portion. The third in the first book of the Torah, it's called Lech Lecha, and that means to journey forward. It begins with a command that God gives to Avram Avinu. Abraham is 75 years old, he's accomplished. <laughs> he's been through the ringer, thrown into a fiery furnace, miraculously the power from a very early age. At the age of three, he begins to seek out the Creator and he knows that the status quo of idolatry simply isn't real. It can't be true. The world can't be an accident, Avram reasons. According to Maimonides, by the time Avram Avinu was 48, he has perfected his special theory on monotheism, and he creates monotheistic revival. Revival because, you know, Noah believed in Hashem and he was a tzaddik. There were other righteous people in the past, but all of that seems to have fallen by the wayside. Nimrod, a powerful political dictator or leader, is trying to incite the entire world to rebel against Hashem, and he almost successfully achieves that with the narrative of the Tower of Babel. By this point, humanity has become dispersed over the globe, and Avraham Avinu, much, much younger than Nimrod, born 1,948 years from creation, faces off with the powers to be. Eventually, Avraham Avinu left the city of Urkastim, where he was cast into a fiery furnace, where his brother was burnt alive. And in the end of last week's Torah portion, we read of Avraham Avinu abandoning his elderly father after they came to Choron together. And it happens here, where Abraham gets the word. Leave behind everything that you've built and accomplished. And head off into an uncertain future. You can't even type a destination into your GPS. El Ha'aretz Asher Areka, to the land that I will show you. Hashem blesses Avram, and Avram heads off to Canaan. There, the promise of the future homeland of the nation that he and Sarah will build is received. Things don't go well. Avram Avinu is forced, after a short time, to head down into Mitzrayim. Mother Sarah is abducted by no other than the Pharaoh himself. Avram foresaw this, but was unable to prevent it. Miraculously, she's protected, and now they're heading back to Canaan, much, much wealthier than the way they left. Lot, Avram's nephew, quarrels. They simply can't get along, unfortunately. The nephew, at this point, now that money's entered the equation, is unprepared to live a life of devotion and dedication and sacrifice. He heads off for sin city of the day. And Hashem renews his promise to Avraham now that Lot is absent. We hear about a world war of antiquity. Four kings versus five kings. The four kings are victorious. They capture Lot to make a mockery of him and ultimately Avraham. Father Abraham goes to war against the mightiest axis of his day. And once again, miracle upon miracle, Avraham Avinu is victorious. Here Hashem comes to Avraham and says, do not be fearful. Despite the fact that you have seen many miracles, there's much more in store. He promises Avraham Avinu offspring, and Parshas Lech Lecha narrates the details of the covenant 
that God makes with Avram Avinu, Brit Bein Habsarim, the covenant between the parts. We hear about Hagar, a handmaid, who Sarah asks Avram to marry because she seeks to do kindness with another. Really a very complex subject and one perhaps for a different class. In the end, after much turmoil, Avram and Hagar have a child. His name is Ishmael. And the Parsha then climaxes. We are just about a quarter of a century into the narrated journey of Avram's life. From age three where the story begins until age 75, we know very little. The scripture barely alludes to anything that happened in Avram's life. And yet, here in Parsha Lech Lecha, 24 years of extraordinary action and events are recorded and it climaxes with Avram Avinu turning 99 years old when God says to him, it's time to enter into the covenant of Brit Milah. And although Avram Avinu proverbially kept all of the mitzvahs, all of the mitzvahs, even the rabbinic ideas, this is one mitzvah he didn't do and that's a discussion for another day. Bottom line is, on a simple level, if Avram Avinu would have performed this mitzvah before he was commanded, he couldn't do it again. And that would be a very bad idea because Avram Avinu knew there was virtue and value to actually receiving a command from God for a mitzvah that is done by virtue of God's behest is far more powerful than one that comes at the initiation of humankind. We are limited. Even Avram Avinu has a glass ceiling. And so when it comes from Hashem, it's a whole different kind of reality. And we're going to focus on this, on this notion of Brit Milah and its central importance to our faith, the foundational mitzvah upon which, in a sense, our people are founded. It is here that Avram Avinu will enter into his new persona. It is now that Avram is going to receive his new name Proverbially speaking, a metamorphosis of Avram and Sarah will unfold in the aftermath of the Brit Milah, but that's next week's Parsha. And so, at the end of Parsha's Lech Lecha, in verse 17, Hashem comes to Avram Avinu, pardon me, in chapter 17, Hashem comes to Avram Avinu, and He gives him this commandment. Avram Avinu is told by God, in the beginning of chapter 17, and I'll just share the opening verses with you before we zoom in to the final verses of the Parsha. Avraham Avinu is now 99 years old. God appears to him. Again, this time, it's to prepare him to conceive a child through Sarah. That's the foundation of the Jewish people. God informs him that he's about to give him a mitzvah. A mitzvah is best translated as a commandment, not a good deed. Good deeds are things I can elect to do. Avram elected to do many good deeds. Commandments necessarily need a commander, namely God. So good deeds do not speak to the presence of a commander, a mitzvah mitzvah. When people tell me that a mitzvah to them is a good deed, it really worries me because Atheists can do good deeds too. Only a person who understands that mitzvahs are the currency of our relationship with God, the mechanism, the convention through which we are able to nurture and develop the innate spiritual potential that God gave every one of us. Only when God is part of that equation does the mitzvah actually become meaningful. But we'll talk about that a little later on. Avraham Avinu is somewhat concerned about differentiating himself from other people and afraid that this will discourage others from embracing monotheism. And Hashem said to Avram, I am God Almighty. I'll overcome these repercussions. You should not worry. His halich lefana, it's time for you to walk before me or walk in my ways. Veheye samim. And you should be, so to speak, intact or perfect. So Avram Avinu is going now to enter into Hashem's ways. Everything's going to be just fine. You'll be perfect. 
I will give you ve'etna briti ve'ni uve'necha. I will give you this covenant. It, this covenant will be an agreement, like a deal. It'll be between me and between you, and in the merit of observing this commandment, this mitzvah, you will receive the promised land, and I will make you exceedingly numerous for arba oscha the ma'od ma'od. So here we have the notion of etna briti beni uveinecha. That's in verse two. In verse seven, God says to Abraham, moti et briti beni uveinecha. I will establish or maintain this covenant between me and between you. And now God adds uvein zar acha acharecha, and between your progeny who will follow. We'll come back to these verses, beni uveinecha, just between us. But in the meantime. Now that we have opened the subject of circumcision, or Brit Milah, let's go to the end of the Torah portion. Parshas Lech Lecha climaxes with this notion that Avraham actually did it. Verse 23 of chapter 17 records, Vayomol es besar or latam be'etzam ayomazeh. Avraham Avinu then circumcised the flesh of all the males amongst his people on that very day. And in verse 24, getting closer to the subject, V'avrohom ben tishim v'tesha shana behimolo besar orlato. Avraham Avinu is 99 years old when the flesh of his foreskin was circumcised. In the language of the Me'amlois, in his commentary, he says, and so it was in the year 2047 from creation, at the time that Father Abraham is 99, on the 10th day of Tishrei, which is Yom Kippur, on that morning, Avraham was circumcised. Now we'll take a look at the sources for the, what the Ma'amalo has just told us in a moment. I just want to focus on the next verse just for a minute, and then we're going to take a look at some sources together. Verse 25. V'yishmoel b'no ben shlosha seshana Ishmael is 13 days, 13 years old on that day, v'himolo et besar alato, and verse 26. This will be a major focus of today's class. Be'etzem hayom hazeh. And it was on that very day. Nimol Avraham, v'yishmoel b'no Abraham, and Ishmael his son were circumcised. Let's begin our journey today by taking a look at the Medrash Rabbah, we're going to look at Medrash Rabbah that's found in chapter 46 of the Medrash Rabbah. And Avram was 99 years old, and it was Be'etzem Hayom Hazer. The Medrash says to appreciate the meaning of and on that very day, we should look to the book of Kohelet. And there, in the, in the book of Ecclesiastics, right in the beginning of the third chapter, are the famous words in which King Solomon wisely intones, La kol zmon vo'et. For everything, there is a time. La kol chefetz tachat for all desire under the heavens. And the Medrash comments, Zman hoyolo la'avraham. This is a predestined time, a time for Abraham. In other words, for everything there is a time. For everything there is a precise moment. This was Abraham's moment. Not when he was thrown into a fiery furnace. Not when he receives the command, hit the road, leave home, forget about whatever success you've achieved, and head into an uncertain future. That wasn't the moment. It wasn't the moment when Avram is forced to leave the land that God just told him to head into. It wasn't the moment when his wife is abducted and he doesn't lose faith. This is Abraham's hour. The time that the circumcision, the Brit Mila, was given to him. Shenemar, for it is written, Genesis. 17, verse 26, we just read this passage together. So 
So the Medrash Shabbat is very clear about this being Abraham's hour. Now, when precisely was that? As I just shared with you from the Mamloa, as that was on Yom Kippur. This, of course, is found in the Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer in the 29th chapter. And let me read to you from the actual verbiage text. The Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer, the teachings compiled, Midrashic teachings compiled by the famous teacher of Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Eliezer ben Hurkanus, a man who sacrificed everything, gave away wealth and fame, and left home. He was brought up in a very secular environment in Jerusalem. Not much has changed. And he embraces Torah with tremendous personal cost and becomes one of the greatest sages of all times. And he has a thin volume of Midrashic teaching that is really not found anywhere else. So the Pirkei de Belezer records a teaching on the words Be'etzem Hayom. Mahu Be'etzem Hayom Azeh. What is the meaning of right in the midst of this day? So he says, well, we see the word Be'etzem Hayom Azeh with regard to the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippurim. And here, the Pirkei de Rebbe Lezer comments, Ma'alahalon, just as with regard to Yom Kippur. The Torah states, V'chol molocha lo ta'asu be'etzem hayom hazeh. One should not perform any kind of creative mundane work on this very day. That's because ki yom kippurim hu, because it is the day of atonement. Says the Pirkei, the Rebbe Eliezer, Shebi yom kippurim nimol Avraham. It was on Yom Kippur that Avraham Avinu was circumcised. Now, for the full picture, I have to tell you that this dovetails very beautifully into another medrash that tells us when, several days later, the malochim, the angels, came to visit Avram. He said, why don't you spend some time in the shade of the tree? And that that refers to a sukkah. However, there is another medrashic tradition that says that this happened on Yud Aleph Nisan, the 11th day of Nisan. That was the hour. That was the day. And that the days later was actually on Pesach. So we have two narratives. I actually once delivered a class on this. It's available online. It's all about was it on Sukkot or was it on Pesach and a possible resolution for that. But that's available. You have to Google that and you can watch that on your own time. Bottom line. We are going to follow the school of thought, a majority school of thought, that this is happening on Yom Kippur. And that's Be'etzim Yom Hazeh. This is Avram's finest hour, the hour in which he receives the commandment. Now, the Medrash Rabbah, a little bit later on, suggests that not only was this Be'etzim Yom Hazeh, this Avram's hour, but in fact, not only was his day, but precise hour. The Medrash Rabbah, in the same chapter, in subsection 9, says, Omar Rabbi Berechia, Loi miroish besesa dibarti. I did not give this message in a secretive or concealed way. Omar HaKadosh Baruch Hu, God said, Ilu mol Avraham balayla. If Avraham, Father Abraham, were to circumcise himself at night, Hayu kol b'nei doirei oimrim, then all of the well, let's just call it the open-minded civilization of Avram's day. You know, the fair-minded people. The people who don't like circumcision today either, because not much has changed. Avram Avinu was challenged in his time, and they would say, If we will see him doing something like that, We would never let him do that to himself, to religious. Too painful, too bloody, impossible, we will stand in his way. That notion has been adopted by the enemies and challengers of our Jewish faith from time immemorial. Sometimes we were challenged in courts of law. Sometimes we were challenged by raging mobs. Sometimes by the actual oppressive governments of the day who forbade circumcision most recently, Nazi Germany, and then following them, communist Russia. 
the Soviet Union that outlawed circumcision. Today, it's the elites of Hollywood who mock us and say, stop cutting your babies, as a famous actor tweeted several years ago. And today, the extreme left is attacking the Jewish people once again for quote unquote maiming innocent babies. There's even a lawsuit being launched against all the Jewish people. Funny enough, it's called intact. And that's precisely what Avraham Avinu was told by God, walk before me and be intact or perfect. At any rate, we can see that not much has changed historically. And yet we, the children of Avraham Avinu, are commanded to be inspired by his example and to be able to show conviction and strength in the face of adversity. And God said to Avraham Avinu from the very beginning, you will have to stand tall, proud, and possibly alone, but I will be with you. Be'etzem hayom hazeh. And Medr says three incredible words. Dirgishle yimalel. The one who is bothered by this, go right ahead. Begin your protests. Bring it on. The Eitz Yosef commentary on the Medr says that even though Brit Milah typically is observed first thing in the morning. We try to do it at sunrise. Avram Avinu is the one who embraced mitzvahs with great alacrity. In fact, the reason we, in today's day and age, seek to perform Brit Milah first thing in the morning is because we learn about zrizut, alacrity, to rush, seize the moment to do a mitzvah from Avram Avinu himself. Nonetheless, Eitz Yosef says, Kan himten Avram. Here, Avram waited ad itzumi shol yoyim. And even though the Ma'am Lois calls it boker, he says, Sha, gimel sha'ot bayom. This is three hours after sunrise. So let's say, proverbially speaking, sunrise is at 7 a.m. This would be at 10 o'clock in the morning. High morning. Sha'akol ne'urim. Everybody's up by now. In the language of the Mishnah, in Mesechet Brachot, even Bnei Malachim freely translated as teenagers, are up by the time it's 9 a.m. This is because it had to be done with great fanfare. This was not going to be a secretive, a furtive fulfillment of God's command. So we know that it's Avram's hour, it's Avram's day, and it's Avram's finest hour. It's the day of atonement, the day we're closest to Hashem. It's high morning. Everybody's up a very public spectacle, if you will. And that's when Nimal Avraham. And the Torah wants us to know that. And the Torah repeats the words Be'etzem Hayom Hazeh twice in verse 23 and again in verse 26. Omar Rabbi Abba Bar Kahana. Rabbi Abba Bar Kahana commented on these very words. Hirgish Vinitzta'er. Avraham Avinu felt, he felt the pain. Kedei sheyichbola HaKadosh Baruch Hu So that God would double his reward. The commentary on the Medrash called Imre Yoshar says, Ulazen nichbal posuk be'etzam hayem According to Rabbi Abba Bar Kahana, he's responding to Rabbi Berechia. Rabbi Berechia says, it says, to emphasize that this was done in full view of the public. It was not a secretive, clandestine affair. But Rabbi Abba Bar Kahana says, it was repeated twice. It's not just about it being done loudly and proudly. It's because Avraham Avinu felt the pain. So the Torah emphasizes it. Hirgish, he felt, and he was pained so that his reward, remuneration, would be twice as intense. We'll come back to this matter soon. So now we know that Avram Avinu has essentially performed, this is the finest hour for Avram, it's done in a very public way, and everybody knows that Avram Avinu has performed the Brit Milah. At this point, I want to take a moment to look together with you into the words of Rashi. In Rashi's commentary on the Chumash, 
Be'etzem hayom hazeh, at this very day, Avraham Avinu was, so to speak, Avraham Avinu was, was uh, circumcised. First Avraham Avinu circumcises everybody. And then in verse 24, it says, And Avraham was ben tishim v'seisha shana. He's 99 years old. Behi molo besar or lato. Let me repeat that. Avraham Avinu is 99 years old when the flesh of his foreskin was circumcised. So Rashi says, Rashi says, comments on the words behimolo, when he was circumcised, that this should be understood and read as behipoalo. Behipoalo means when it happened. Now when it happened, is what you call l'shoi nifal. L'shoi nifal means, let me just straighten the camera. Okay. Not quite. I think we're good now. Sorry about that. In another version of Rashi, it says, Kimo, for example, Behi Baram. Behi Baram means when they were created. In other words, it doesn't say who did this. It says Avram was 99 when he was circumcised. It's a matter of fact telling. Lashon Nifal is to say that something was done, but it doesn't tell us who did it. It doesn't say that Avram Avinu was 99 years old when he circumcised himself or when somebody circumcised him. It says he was 99 when he was circumcised. It's as if to say something was written. We would say nichtav. Something was closed. Nizgar. It doesn't say who did it. It was. It happened. So Avram Avinu got circumcised, but doesn't say who did it. Now, there's another version, there's a version, an old version of Rashi that adds the words now the following. Behimolo. In this version of Rashi, it says the following. Our sages asked the question, who did it? It says it was done. It doesn't tell us who did it. Who did it? And the answer is, and I'm quoting from Rashi, but soon we'll go back to the original sources. Not al Avraham Sakin. Avraham took the surgical knife. Va'achaz ba'arlato, he held his foreskin. This is painful. 99 year old man. Veratza lachtoch, he wanted to cut the foreskin as he was commanded to. Vahaya mityare, and he was afraid. He was afraid he wouldn't cut successfully. Now, probably this is because he was afraid he wouldn't be able to hold the knife steadily. Some people faint at the sight of blood. Having to cut yourself in that sensitive a place with a sharp knife is a little bit scary. If you're 99, your hand might tremble a little. And if your hand trembles and you're in a very sensitive spot, and you cut the wrong place. Ouch! So Avram's worried. Ma asa Kodesh Baruch What does God do? Zarashi says, proverbially speaking, Sholach Yodoi, Hashem, so to speak, set forth his hand, Va'achaz imai, and he held the knife together with him. Shenemar, as it is written in the book of Nehemiah, in the ninth chapter, the charot imo habrit. He cut the brit together with him. Well, there you got it. Rashi telling us a medrash. This medrash is found in the Tanchuma Yashan. It's found in a version of the Medrash Rabba. And interestingly enough, it is also found in the Yalkut Shimoni on Nehemiah. In fact, the Yalkut Shimoni says, Avram mitiare lachtoch. Avram was afraid to cut. 
And so God set forth his hand and held the hand. Achaz imo. And the Medrash Yalkut Shimoni adds the words, quote, Vahaya Avraham Chotech. Avraham was cutting. However, Hashem was holding his hand and Avraham cut. So, kind of, God steadies his hand and Avraham cuts. To be precise, the Medrash Tanchuma asks the question. Ask the question. Rashi doesn't exactly ask the question. He precipitates the question, but doesn't exactly ask the question. The Medrash Tanchuma says, Umi Yimaloti. Avram asked the question. He said, God, who will circumcise me? God said back, Omar Lo God says, Ata, la'atzmecha. You'll be doing this to yourself. So the Medrash Tanchuma says, Not Avram is acherev. He took the sharp blade. And here, the Medrash Tanchuma adds words that we didn't find in Rashi. He was old and as such afraid. Now, presumably afraid, he wouldn't cut right or things wouldn't work out. According to the Medrash Tanchuma, the conversation continues. Omer Lefanov, God says before, uh, he says before God, Rabbeinu Shalei, the master of the universe, Zaken Ani, you know, I'm a little old here. What does God do? He held his hand, sent forth his hand, held together with him. That is the precise verbiage of the Medrash Tanchuma. So we have a Yaakot Shimoni, a Medrash Tanchuma Yoshan, as well as a version of Medrash Rabba. And here it's pretty clear that Avram Avinu was cutting, but he was not alone. The Chida, Rabbeinu Yosef Chaim David Azulay Emid Ber Kedemais, suggests that this is the meaning of what we read earlier. The Etna Briti Beini U Beinecha. If you'll remember, as I pointed out to you, it shows up, that statement shows up twice when God speaks about Brit Milah. First time it says, Hashem says to him, I will create this bond between me and you. And then HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, after telling Avram Avinu that this bond will be between me and you, when he speaks about between me and you in future, again it's Beini u Beinecha. So in Midbar Kedemes, the Chidah suggests that this is what the Torah is alluding to when it says, the Etna Briti, Beini u Beinecha, that is to say, Beinenu, between us. Between us. So between us, that's how this happened. We did this, so to speak, together. Okay, to recap, we've heard about the day, the date, the finest hour. Now we were moving on to who performed the circumcision. And in Pshuta Shal Mikra, it's Avraham. But that doesn't exactly work. And so we have divine intervention God aids Avraham Avinu, stealing his hand, enabling him to perform the Brit Milah. However, there are two other schools of thought. Let's go back to the Pirkei the Rebbe Eliezer. In the Pirkei the Rebbe Eliezer, the question is raised. Who did it? And Rabbi Pirkei the Rebbe Eliezer says, Rabbi Gamliel Omer, the head of the Sanhedrin, grandson of Hillel, Rabbi Gamliel said, Sholach v'koro l'shem ben Noach. This is shame, shame's second appearance in the Parsha. The first time he appears as Melech Shalem, the king of Salem or Jerusalem, Yerushalayim. It's not called Yerushalayim yet, it's just called Ir Shalem. Most of the Semites have been routed from the land of Canaan. It has now been occupied by a people who have taken the name Canaanite. They are Chumites, descendants of Chum. They were not supposed to be in this particular region. This geography was given to the seed of Shem. The Canaanites have no greater claim than Abraham, a direct descendant of Shem, because he arrives in Canaan just when the Chumites are conquering the land. They're not the indigenous people. Abraham represents the indigenous people. We are the indigenous people. 
of Eretz Yisro. At any rate, Rabbi Gamliel says, when Avram Avinu got this command, he's in Hebron, it's not far from Jerusalem, he sends a message to the king of Jerusalem, the son of Noah, shame, the righteous same, and he says, please, I need your help to fulfill God's mitzvah. Now, according to a medrash, Avram was well acquainted with shame long before they met after the conclusion of the battle I mentioned at the outset of today's class. In fact, Avram Avinu, at a younger age, had traveled to Canaan and spent time studying in the academy, in the yeshiva of shame, who had a monotheistic academy without much of a footprint and didn't have a great impact on anywhere outside the walls of the school. Whereas, of course, Avram is the one who brands the notion of monotheism and makes it into an international phenomenon. So, according to the Pirkei Derbe Lezer, he sent for shame Umoles Besar Lase. He is the one who circumcises Yishmael, and he is the one who circumcises Avraham. As it says, Be'etzem Hayom Azen Nimol, the Pasuk says he was circumcised. It doesn't tell us who did it. It's not really important who did it, but shame is the world's first mohel. He is the one who does it. And now, my friends, I'm going to share with you another opinion. This idea comes from a Medrash Tanchuma. The Medrash Tanchuma says, Omar Rabbi Yishmael, v'hoyo yeshev Avram v'tomei. Avram Avinu was sitting and wondering, Hey, Chimel, how am I going to do this? At the time when God tells Avram Avinu, I will place the covenant between us. What does it say afterwards? It says, Avram falls upon his face. Now, according to Rashi, this is actually the beginning of the commandment. So right at the outset, when God first speaks to Avram Avinu, and he says, I want you to be whole, intact, perfect, walk before me. In verse 3, it says, Vayipal Avram Alpanov. He threw himself on his face. Now, according to Rashi, he always did this when God spoke to him before he was circumcised, as if to hide the Brit Milah, the uncircumcised procreative organ which indicates a lack of control over erotic urges. He did not have the spiritual stamina, so to speak, to withstand the awe of divine revelation before Brit Milah. After Brit Milah, Avram Avinu is sitting and later standing when God speaks to him. But according to this Medesh Tanchuma, the notion of Avram fell upon his face indicates something else. It says he fell on his face and the Medrash Tanchuma says, and I quote, Va'akotzei Akrov, a scorpion bit him, ouch, right there, v'nimtza mahu. And the scorpion's bite removed the foreskin. And that's the meaning of nimal, he was circumcised. Who did it? Nobody. It happened. He was circumcised. He was circumcised by the bite of a scorpion. The Chidah in Midbar Kedemus says, Avram Avinu was afraid, and he says, Ak obo akra He quotes this Medrash. And then he says, he quotes a particular Harav Avraham Hayachini. I don't know who that is, but it's somebody, a great, another great Sephardic sage being quoted here by the Chidah, who says that the words are alluded to in the verse we just read, or I should say in the verses we just read, because the word that it's repeated twice, indicating twice the pain, as we just learned a few moments ago, is Be'etzem Hayom Hazeh. Be'etzem is spelled Be'ez Ayin Tzadik Mem. And he says these four Hebrew letters, Be'etzem, are a Rashi Tevot, are an acronym for Be'akitzat, by the bite, that's Bayes, Akrov, Ayan stands for the scorpion, Tzadik, the righteous, meaning Avraham, Mol. Ba'akitzatz, Akrov, Mol Tzadik, by the bite of a scorpion, was the righteous man circumcised. 
So the Chidah brings this in Midbar Kedemis, and then he brings the Yalkot Shimoni, which we talked about, saying that God had circumcised Avram. So now, my friends, we have three opinions as to how Avram Avinu got circumcised. The straightforward opinion seems Avram did it to himself. However, God held his hand, so to speak. So that answers the question as to how did he do that to himself? Another opinion is shame. The son of Noah did it to him. And now we have a third school of thought in Torah which says it happened by the bite of a scorpion. And of course, how do we reconcile all these different views? How did Avraham Avinu get circumcised? In a contemporary book, which is primarily a collection of different sources, but on occasion offers some novel insight, the author wants to suggest of Oitzer Ploy Satere, wants to suggest that there were a number of different portions or parts of this event. There is what's called Mila, and then there's what's called Priya. There's the actual cutting, there's the opening of the wound, and then there's something called mitzitza, which is a force of suction that causes the blood to flow through, which causes temporary bleeding, but ensures that the healing is proper. And he wants to suggest that the cutting is one thing, mila, and then the priya is something else. In fact, there's an interesting tosfus, which is found in Mesechet Yevamot, and there, the Tosfos on page 71, side B, suggests that Avraham Avinu only received the mitzvah of Mila, but did not receive the details of Piriya. And the Tosfos says that even though Avraham Avinu did not receive the second detail, which is part of Brit Mila in today's day and age, Avraham Avinu nonetheless performed Piriya because we know that Avraham Avinu performed all of the mitzvot and the customs our Medrash says even a Ruvi Tafshilin, even a mechanism by virtue of which we can cook on Yom Tov to prepare for Shabbat, which was only brought into enactment in the time of the first base on Megdash. So this is a much later development, and yet Avraham Avinu was prophetically or intuitively aware of the development of Judaism, and he followed even the little details and customs. And so the Eitz Applaus wants to suggest that Avraham Avinu cut the akrov, opened the wound, and shame performed the act of suction, which enabled the blood to flow. And so really, he suggests all these were involved. There were many partners or many participants in this event. Of course, what exactly happened, I don't know. When Mashiach will come, we'll know for sure. The question, of course, is, was that painful? Was that painful? I would say very painful. Imagine in a few moments having to deal with cutting the bris mila, God steadying his hand, the bite of a scorpion opening the wound, oy vey, and then somebody making sure that suction happens? It's gotta be very painful. Well, Probably was. The Medrash says it was super painful. Here we have the words of the Medrash that I mentioned before. According to Rabbi Abba Bar Kahana, it was twice as painful. Hirgish, he felt it. When it's tired, he was pained. And that's all. So that God would bring about an addition in reward. I know you want to hear about marijuana. We're getting there. We will talk about cannabis, I promise. But first, Omar Rabbi Levi, welcome to the diversity of thought only found in Torah. You will never find the monochromatic per perspective in Torah. You will always find multiple ideas. Elo elu divri lekim chayim. All of these are the words of the living God. All of this is the vibrantly true Torah, which is filled with a cacophony of color and commentary. And they all have to somehow be balanced into a synergy of understanding. Rabbi Abba Bar Kahana has emphasized for us the notion of pain. Omar Rabbi Levi. Rabbi Levi responds 
And he says, Mol Avraham ein ketivkan. It doesn't say he was circumcised. It says nimol, he was. It doesn't speak about the act of circumcision. It speaks about the matter of fact. He was circumcised. He is now circumcised. It doesn't say he was cut and then circumcised. In other words, the circumcised, the nimol, is describing his state of being, not describing the event or the activity that led to the final result. The final result is nimol. And so, Rabbi Levi says, in the midst of all this, Bodak Atzmai Avram takes a look. Umatza Atzmai Mahu. He finds himself circumcised. Now we have a, a three way conversation over here. This conversation, or this, this uh, teaching, this is Rabbi, we have Rabbi Berechia here, and we have Rabbi Abba Barkahana, and we have Rabbi Levi. Rabbi Berechia comments, and he says, Bahahi Ita, at that moment, Akil Rabbi Abba Barkahana Reb Levi. Reb Levi, Abba Barkahana disparaged. The word Akil means almost like dismissed Rabbi Levi. Oh boy, did he dismiss him. He said, Rabbi Abba Barkahana, Shakrana, liar, Kazbana, cheater, at you are. A liar and cheater are you. Wow. Ella, rather, Hirgish, he did feel. And it's tire. And he was pained. And that was Kadesha Yichbala Kadesh Baruchus Chare. So we have this clear dispute in the Medrash, a dispute on argument. Did he feel pain or didn't he feel pain? We know when this happened. We got a picture of that. We know we have a, an idea of who was involved in this circumcision. We got a, a, a threesome of God, shame, and the scorpion, and Avraham Avinu himself, a foursome, if you will. And we have Rabbi Abba Bar Kahana twice emphasizing the notion of pain, which is reiterated in the Torah with the word Bi'etzem Hayom Azeh, twice to tell us how much pain Avraham had to increase the remuneration, the recompense or reward that Avraham Avinu would receive. And then we have in the midst of this a teaching of Reb Levi who says, Nimal, doesn't say he was circumcised. There's no verb, there's a noun, matter of fact. And this day Avraham, whoa, look at that. He was circumcised as if it happened. We don't know how it happened. He just knew about the end result. To which Rabbi Abba Bakahana responds so angrily and vociferously, disparaging the other sage, calling him a liar and a cheater, and says, No, there was pain. Don't deny the pain. So, how are we to understand this, this dispute? And we're going to talk about pain and glory now. So, what's, what's the glory in pain? Why is it so important to have pain? What if we could do the same thing painlessly? Wouldn't that be better? What's wrong with Rabbi Levi's approach? Why did Rav Kahana, Abba Bar Kahana, get so angry? I have to tell you, it's not common for the sages to speak to each other using this kind of verbiage. It's common for the sages to argue and dispute. If you'll ever study the writings of our sages, you will always see a plethora of different approaches and opinions. That's always going to be the case. There's always intense diversity in Torah. Torah true diversity, not mumbo-jumbo. Now everybody can't make up their own ideas. Torah ideas. But this kind of very militant response, disparaging his fellow, calling him a liar and a cheater, was that called for? And why is it that Rabbi Abba Bar Kahana has to emphasize pain? What's the glory in pain? In the Sefer Oneg Shabbat, there's a very interesting, this is a 18th century work on the Medrash, very interesting take on what might have motivated the difference in approaches, the diversity of opinion between Rabbi Levi and Rabbi Abba Barkana. The Oneg Shabbat suggests that Rabbi Levi 
was believed that Avram Avinu did this mitzvah out of ahava, out of love. And that makes sense. The Rambam clearly states in Hilchot Tshuva that we should serve Hashem not for rewards, but out of love. That's a famous Mishnah which is found right in the beginning of Mesechet Avot, Pirkei Avot, Antigonus, the leader of the Jewish people in the post uh, initiation of the second commonwealth of the Jewish people, the second generation of the second commonwealth, Antigonus said, do not serve the master in order to receive rewards. Serve the master out of love, not to receive reward. The commentaries say that means out of love. And Rambam says in Hilchus Tshuva, and I think it's in the third chapter, he says that this is the way of Avraham, who does the truth because it's true. And he's called Avraham Ohavi. So that makes sense. And he says, when things are done out of love, there is no pain. There's no pain. Because it's a, an act of love. The story is told that somebody once asked the Rebbe. The Rebbe was in his, the end of his eighth decade, in his 90th year. And he would stand on his feet without a washroom or coffee break for hours on end, distributing dollars to initiate acts of tzedakah, personally initiate acts of tzedakah with every person that he would meet and take the opportunity to bless them. I don't know if ever before in history the greatest Jewish leader of his time was available to everybody and anybody so copiously, so often. I mean, it's unbelievably taxing. And the story goes that somebody once asked the Rebbe, isn't the Rebbe tired? To which the Rebbe responded, one does not tire when counting diamonds. The Rebbe's Ahavat Yisrael, the Rebbe's incredible ocean of love towards every single person that he met enabled him to see diamonds. And so he maintained that it was not painful, but something that filled him with delight. This is what Rebbe is saying. Rebbe is saying that Avram did this out of love. And he says, we know our sages teach us less. There is no greater form of service than the service that's motivated by love. For the one who serves out of love serves in a far greater manner. Twice so as one who serves out of Yira. And that's why Avraham Avinu didn't feel anything. Scorpions, knives, he didn't feel anything. The Baba Bakahana says no. When it came to this specific mitzvah, although Avraham typically followed the path of love, and expressed his love for Hashem every time he could when it came to this mitzvah. Avraham Avinu wanted to do this out of yira, out of awe, out of reverence. And so he wanted to feel the pain. He wanted to suffer through the mitzvah so that he would do the will of God out of Hashem's command, out of obedience. So whilst Avraham Avinu always initiated this mitzvah, he was following orders. And that demands subservience. And the greatest of subservience is like the servant, like the Eved, not the Ben, not the son or child who proverbially serves their parents out of love, but the servant who performs their duties out of profound awe and reverence. And this particular mitzvah was different than all the others because here Avram got a commandment. And the Oynik Shabbos finishes off. Both are the words of the living God. And there is truism in both of these approaches. Now, it's a beautiful explanation. But there's two very important questions that I would ask the Oynik Shabbos if I could. I would say, Rabbi Oynik Shabbos, Number one, then why the disparagement? I understand 
the difference in opinions. But why call him a liar and a cheater? Seems to be entirely uncalled for. And this explanation in no way justifies, clarifies, or explains the militant vociferousness of Rabbi Abba Bar Kahana's response. Number two, at the end of the day, service out of Ahava is greater. And that's what characterized Avraham Avinu's service to Hashem. Surely he would have done an actual mitzvah, a commandment he received out of love. What is really the virtue or value of serving Hashem out of Yirah when the Einik Shabbos himself acknowledges the words of our sages, Godol schar ha'oyev mischar ha'yore kiflayim. Doing it out of love is twice as great. So why do it? What is the opinion of Rabbi Abar Bar Kahana, which he so zealously defends, so vociferously rejects the approach of Rabbi Levi? And the Einig Shabbos' explanation really does not do this justice or give us a satisfying answer. So, today's class I'm going to conclude by taking you to an incredible sicha, an edited talk of the Rebbe. It's found in Lakuta Sichas in the 10th volume. It's based on a sicha primarily, although there's other sources here too. It's primarily based on a sicha that the, the Rebbe delivered not on a Shabbos and not even on Parshas Lech Lecha, but rather on a Shabbos Parshas Pinchas. It was the 19th of Tammuz, and that is the day that the Rebbe's Rebbe, the Friedrich Rebbe, was entered into the covenant of Bris Mila. At any rate, a remarkable sicha that touches on many, many subjects. I'm going to zoom into two elements, only two parts of this particular edited rumination. Part one of this rumination that I'm sharing with you is an explanation and a statement that the Alter Rebbe makes in the second version of the Shulchan Aruch. The Alter Rebbe at the behest of the Maggid of Mizrich authored a code of law. The code of law authored by Rabbi Yosef Karo was now centuries old and had garnered a tremendous amount of commentary. And it was time for synthesis or a restatement of the Shulchan Aruch. The Maggid of Mizrich, feeling this was a critical need for Klal Yisrael, commissions his young and brilliant pupil, the Alter Rebbe, Rabbi Shneir Zalman, at the time of Liadi, to write a Shulchan Aruch. The Alter Rebbe later on in his life began to rewrite the Shulchan Aruch. It's called Mahadura Tinyana. Sadly, it was a work that was never finished and much of what was written was also lost. So we only have the first few chapters of the Shulchan Aruch rewritten. The primary distinction, as the Shar HaKoylel writes, between the first version of the Shulchan Aruch and the second is that the first is based primarily on the poskim or exoteric sources in Torah, whereas the second is based very heavily on the tradition of the Kabbalists as well. To be sure, the subject of the first version of the Alter Rebbe Shulchan Aruch and the second version of the Alter Rebbe Shulchan Aruch is a it's, it's a subject that requires great attention, and we're glossing over things now, but that's not the point. Let me remind you of where we are and where we're going. We talked about the Parsha, the climax, the idea of the Brit Milah. We talked about it being the day, the hour, and we talked about how it happened. A variety of opinions were introduced, and we came to a head with the notion of pain. An emphasis in the Medrash on pain and an argument between two sages of whether or not Avraham Avinu felt it. So now, to understand why the glory is in the pain and what that has to do with the modern day question of legalization of cannabis or marijuana. That's what we're up to now. The Alter Rebbe 
in Madura Tinyana of the Shulchan Aruch, in the end of Simon Dalit, says the following. The beginning of the entrance of this holy soul happens at the time of the Brit Milah. That is to say, that although you're born Jewish, the Neshama doesn't enter the body until the Brit Milah. Rebbe says, what? This does not seem to be understood. Before birth, the baby didn't have a neshama. He wasn't, so to speak, in possession of his Jewish soul. By the way, this means that a baby girl has a neshama from the moment of birth. But a baby boy doesn't get it until he's eight days old. Yeah, so much for our chauvinistic Judaism that not only tells us that a girl becomes obligated or responsible Jewishly a year before a boy, but actually that she's born into it, whereas the baby boy has to have something engineered or done to him in order to get his soul. The Rebbe says, one second. We know for certain that prior to birth, even during gestation, the baby has a soul. After all, the Gemara in Mesechet Nida, on page 30, side B, states, Melamdin oto kol ha-Torah kula. A baby is taught the entire Torah during the period of gestation. You had to have a neshama for that. And on the contrary, the Rebbe suggests in a footnote that the neshama is much more profound because it's unhindered unbothered by the animal soul. There is no selfishness, no Yetzirah. The Yetzirah, we're told, clearly arrives at the moment of birth. So here you have a Neshama studying Torah uninterrupted, unhindered by the Yetzirah. That Neshama learns the whole Torah. How does that fit with this notion that the Neshama doesn't come to the body, isn't entered into who we are corporeally until the time of Brit Milah? And so the Rebbe explains, Knisat, the entrance, the impregnation, no pun intended, of the Nefesh HaKadosh means a chibur pnimi. It means a profound and inner bond between neshama, between holy soul, and between guf, between corporeal existence. So much so that they become singularly enmeshed, that they become woven together as one. In other words, that the impact of the neshama in the body is to be felt in the profoundest way can only take place after Brit Milah. It's true, when the baby is, so to speak, in the womb during gestation, there is a nefesh hakadoshah, However, that neshama hasn't really implanted itself into the body. We also can see that the nefesh achayunis, the animating soul, isn't really implanted in the body until the time of birth either. And that's because the notion of life is defined by drawing a breath. But the mother breathes for the baby. The baby is in liquid and can't breathe. The baby doesn't eat for himself. He's nourished through the intake of the mother. And so the baby is nourished in every way, from oxygen to food, through the intake of the mother. And even after it's born and now it breathes on its own, and even after it's born and it begins to eat on its own, which the nefesh, the, anim the animating force the, the, that makes the body alive, is already implanted in the body, but you do not see the implanting or the impact of the godly soul. It remains like a halo, like an eye cloud, tethered 
but at the same time separate. It's not actually part of the software. It hasn't been downloaded into the frame of its physical existence. When does that happen? The downloading of the neshama. Like going on Wi-Fi and downloading the program, the software, into your phone. Now the app is actually in the frame of that operating system. That happens at the moment of Brit Milah. And that's because... The Brit Milah is Briti, my covenant, Bibisarchem, in your flesh, le Brit Olam, as an eternal and everlasting covenant. The bris that HaKadosh Baruch Hu makes with the flesh, not just the soul, with the corporeal reality of a member of Am Yisrael who performs mitzvahs in the flesh. And this is the virtue of Brit Milah, really, over all other mitzvot. The purpose of a mitzvah is to serve as a nexus, a connecting point, something that can nurture and develop our relationship with God. Mitzvah comes from the term tzavta, from the term connection, because ultimately every mitzvah is an envelope, a platform through which we Mortal beings can achieve a connection with the commander of the mitzvah, the creator. But the mitzvahs don't leave an imprint in the flesh. The hand that gives tzedakah doesn't look any different than the hand that remained clenched. A hand is a hand. In fact, no mitzvah that we perform physically necessarily leaves a lasting imprint imprint with one glaring exception the Brit it physically changes a Jewish man's appearance forever and that notion is representative of the essence of mitzvot at large but also emphasizes for us the uniqueness of the Brit Milah and the Rebbe goes on to develop this idea and explain it in great detail. Now I want to leapfrog to the end of this sicha, end of this talk. The Rebbe says this notion of the holy soul being implanted in the physical corporeal reality of the Jew who receives a brit milah. The notion that ultimately a mitzvah is about connecting the spirit and the flesh so that they become one that the imprint of the mitzvah can be seen in the physical corporeal existence of a yid, like a bris milah. This is not only about the impact or the mark that the mitzvah leaves, but the Rebbe says this is also part of the process. Not only does this mitzvah leave a mark on the body, but the process of leaving its mark also has to be experienced in the flesh. And that, the Rebbe says, is the explanation for this seeming hyper-focus on pain when it comes to the mitzvah of Brit Milah. When it comes to the mitzvah of the covenant of Brit Milah, the Gemara Mesechet Kesubot on page 8 states the terminology, Tzaira the Yanuka. That the idea of Brit Milah is connected to the feelings, the physical feeling of pain, the nerve endings of flesh being cut. That's strange because we know that Simcha is such an important part of how we serve Hashem. After all, King David immortalizes that idea in the 102nd Psalm where he says, Ivdu es Hashem besimcha, serve God with joy. And we know that in the criticism we receive by Moshe Rabbeinu, we're told that the reason that the misfortune befell was because ashaloh avadata, because we didn't serve God besimcha v'tuv levav. So isn't it important to serve God with joy? Shouldn't we be emphasizing the good feeling of a mitzvah? Why do we have to emphasize the pain? And if we could do away with pain, wouldn't that be a great thing? 
Why were we commanded by God to do such a foundational and important mitzvah that leaves its imprinture upon our flesh, our physical reality, specifically in a way of tsar, in a way of pain? Do you know that the Avud Raham, David Avram, in his writings, emphasizes the idea of the bracha of Brit Milah connected to pain? In fact, he says Ashkenazic Jews reject the reciting of the bracha of Shehechi Yonu because there's tzayda of the Yonuka, pain for the child. The Hagos Maimonis, which is a commentary on Rambam in the laws of Brit Milah, when the Rambam says that we should recite a Shehechi Yonu, having thank, thanking God with great joy to having reached this mitzvah, that the other school of thought is we can't really rejoice when a baby is crying, is pain, that the pain inhibits the joy. Hey, what's going on here? Why did God have to make it painful? Why couldn't God enable us to do something that wouldn't be painful? And the Rebbe explains this very notion, this very idea that the pu'ula, that the act of circumcision, the act of Brit Milah, gorem tsar causes pain, hu hu teva haguf bechol pu'ulotav. This is the nature of things bodily. You have to toil and sweat. Things come with effort. It's not easy to get yourself into good shape. It's painful to spend time in the gym. That's the nature of things. One who eats like a glutton has no pain. They also look like a hippopotamus. If you want to be able to put things together, if you want to be able to have it together, that comes with pain. There's the pain of training. Speak to any Olympian who puts in so much time and so much pain. Speak to any person who's involved in the creative process. It's painful. I remember reading that Leonard Cohen, a yid, I think a misguided yid, but a very talented Jew, was in pain trying to figure out the lyrics of a song. They have this description of him sitting on the floor in his underwear, tearing his hair out, trying to get the last bars of music written out. There is pain that comes along with every achievement. You know, that's why they say no pain, no gain. That's the nature of things in the physical material world. It comes with effort, toil, and yes, pain. It's painful, but worth it. And because all things in this world come with effort, toil, and necessarily a certain level of pain. So it is also that ultimately the concept of a mitzvah has to come to us through toil, through effort. Mitzvahs shouldn't be effortless. Life should not be a quote-unquote painless experience. The pain of life is what makes life worth living. To be medicated or checked out, to feel no pain, and to be always blissful is an unnatural state, and it is an unhealthy state, and it is one that does not lead to the path of accomplishment or achievement. The Rebbe here references an important school of rabbinic thought, a binding school of rabbinic thought, that mitzvah of the bris milah has to come through tsar, and the notion of putting a baby under an anesthetic is actually un-Torah. It's not supposed to be done. I've argued with parents not to use the emla patch, which deadens the area of the bris milah. First of all, the recovery takes at least twice as long. I heard this from many medical professionals. Secondly, the pain is part of the mitzvah. You take away the pain at the time of the Brit Milah, later on you cause even more pain, and in the end, you're diminishing from the notion of Brit Milah because Brit Milah is not only that we should be circumcised, but Brit Milah necessarily is something that happens. There's a process, and the process is a part of the picture. 
the father of atheism, from a Jewish perspective, was the Greek philosopher Epicurus. You have the Stoic schools of philosophy, the Aristotelian schools of thought, and then Epicurus. And although most people tend to think that the Stoic school has left a greater impact or that most of what happens today in Western civilization is the brainchild of Socrates, Plato, or Aristotle, sadly, it's actually Epicurus who seems to be super popular today. Karl Marx's hero was Epicurus. Communism, socialism is based on Epicurean writings. Epicurus believed in nothing. He said there is no God, there is no purpose. He was a nihilist. Death, he said, is meaningless. In fact, life is meaningless. And therefore, one should try to live life with as much pleasure and as little pain. Life has no destination. Life has no intrinsic meaning, he taught. He maintained that it's all about the here and now. It was based on Epicurus' ideas that the Romans coined the phrase, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you may die. That's why an Epicurean, which is a modern day word in English, means a person who delights in the pleasures of the flesh and cares about nothing else. Epicurus would tell you, gorge yourself on cannabis. Ha, ah, if only he would have had it. Why feel pain? Why toil? Why have difficulty? Epicurus said you don't need to work that hard to be happy. You can be happy very easily. You can make do with much less. He observed that a person usually experiences pleasure after the pleasurable experience. He said, for example, finest food brings you pleasure. It's the pleasure, not just the pleasure of eating, but the pleasure you achieve. He said just don't eat as much and then you'll you'll have pleasure with a small amount of ordinary food. Contrary to Epicureans of the 21st century, Epicurus didn't eat the finest foods. He purportedly ate bread and water and on occasion some cheese when he needed something nice. And he said, you can just be happy. He shunned hard work. He created a commune called the Garden. And these communes were replicated thousands of times, according to some opinions, hundreds of thousands of times around the Mediterranean basin. By the way, when Christianity rose, it took over those communes and turned them into monasteries. At least that's what the history books say. And in these communes, people had good cheer, good fellowship. They spent time with each other and there was good friendship. It looked very nice. Everybody was enjoying life together. And that's all there was to it. There was no purpose, there was no mission, there was no goal. Avoid pain, he said, at any cost. Have pleasure whenever you can. There are no mores, there are no morals, there is no ethical calling or higher purpose. Forget all of that. We're just a collection of biology. And when we die, nothing is left. He would be delighted at the millennial society. He would be very impressed with cannabis or marijuana made legal. Now let me be clear, it's not a mitzvah to suffer. And if somebody has a headache, of course, taking a Tylenol is a very good idea. It's not a mitzvah to have debilitating pain. And when people are suffering from terrible illnesses, of course, marijuana may be a very effective treatment. If somebody requires pharmacology to be able to live on an equal keel, well, then pharmacology should be used. There's no mitzvah, as they say, to suffer. But life necessarily requires a little bit of pain. You set goals for yourself, you want to achieve things, and it's painful. Yosef Deya, Yosef Machoiv, Shlomo HaMelech wisely observed. The more knowledge you have, the more pain you have, you realize how much you don't know. So should you remain ignoramus? Is ignorance bliss? And if it is, is that the bliss we should look to attain? Think about it, my friends. Everything in life that's called an achievement or accomplishment comes with toil, and toil means effort. 
And toil and effort mean pain. And no pain is no gain. And that's the glory in pain. The glory in pain is that we work at something. We toil at it. Happiness is indeed to be achieved, but it's to be earned. It's to be worked at. And that's what mitzvahs are about. Mitzvahs don't come easily or for free. Long before no pain, no gain, our sages coined the phrase, and it is preserved for posterity in the Mishnah and Avot, lefum tzara agra, the reward which doesn't mean heaven. It means the virtue, the value, the reward of a mitzvah, which is a mitzvah itself, the lasting reward of the relationship that you're able to achieve and enjoy with God, with the Creator, is when it came with pain. A mitzvah that had no pain, a mitzvah that had no struggle, a mitzvah that came sans effort, is a mitzvah that you don't really value and appreciate. You aren't able to savor its taste. But when you work at something and toil at it, that's painful. But then you're able to achieve and accomplish something. That's satisfying. That brings us a joy that is lasting and meaningful. Yeah, in case you haven't figured it out, I'm not for cannabis. Baruch Hashem, I've never taken any kind of drug. That's certainly not at least to feel good. I work hard. And that makes me feel good. I toil at preparing these classes. And I'm in pain before the class because I didn't get it yet. And I don't have it hammered together. And I put myself under extraordinary pressure because, because that's, I want to live a life of meaning. I want to be able to teach Torah. I want you to learn Torah. I want us together to be able to revel in the glory of closeness to Hashem. And that comes with toil only with toil. When Abba Barakahana heard Rebbe Levi say, Avram didn't feel pain, he said, Shakrana, Kasbana, what are you saying? It's a lie. You are cheating people out of their appreciation of their father Abraham. This is the mitzvah that serves as the foundation for all mitzvahs. As the Rebbe explains at length, in the early Sikhs, that the idea of this first mitzvah, there had to be a mitzvah that's the forerunner of all mitzvahs. And because the rest of the mitzvahs were done by virtue of Avram Avinu's own initiation, it didn't come from a higher place. You needed at least one mitzvah. One single command that was a command, rather than something he chose to do. And that becomes the foundation of all mitzvahs. And Reb Levi comes along and says, no pain. There it was, a mitzvah, just like that. So the Enoch the, Shabbos says, yes, yes, it's because Avram Avinu, Avram Avinu was so devoted to Hashem that the most painful thing was because of his great love, it was able to remove from him the pain. And, and the Abba Barakahana becomes so visibly upset. He says, you're robbing generations of Jewish people from their value and appreciation for a mitzvah. Your attitude, your teaching will make them think that mitzvahs achieved by itself is a value and is ideal. And that's a lie. Of course, in the end, the Enoch Shabbos' explanation is very profound and meaningful. And it's even possible that Avraham Avinu, on some level, didn't feel the pain. He's counting diamonds. But at the same time, at the same time, Avraham Avinu felt it. He felt it in his flesh. If he wasn't in pain, the body was in pain. For such is the essential amino acids of a mitzvah. Such is the very nuclear physics, the very essential defining character of a life that is lived in a meaningful, missionful, mitzvah style. And so my friend, in the end, this was Avraham Avinu's finest hour. It was the time when Avraham Avinu finally received a commandment from Hashem. A time in which Avraham Avinu could both delight in the moment, fulfilling his most loving expression to Hashem, and on some level, not even feeling anything. And on the other level, Avram's finest hour, in which 
he was able to bow his head in submission and not initiate, but instead follow. Respond to Hashem's command. Feel the pain in his body. And maybe Avraham and Hashem holding his hand and a scorpion who shows up and maybe that is the meaning of Hashem's hand. Maybe Hashem sent the scorpion. And Shem ben Noach is there and all of this together, all of it is the synergy of the pain and the glory of the climax of Parshas Lech Lecha. Thank you for joining.